like to welcome you to the first rainbow L uh, LGBTQ reading during Pride Month. <laughs> So welcome everybody. So our first, our first read. Oh, and um, we're at the for other people who may uh, be listening who are blind or can't see. We're at the excuse me, the Kellogg Hubbard Library. We have picture windows in the back and a nice, wonderful seating area. So um, our first reader will be Judith Turner. And her writing includes her poetry, including her 2020 book, Minnow, and her 1995 book, Out of History's Jar, Junk Jar, as well as two books of co-translation from Japanese to English with poet Mikhaiko, you can, Michiko. Michiko. Oshi. Two recent anthologies that include her poems on queer nature and Roads Taken, Contemporary Vermont Poetry. She has taught undergraduate creative writing, directed a nonprofit in arts and disability, and currently serves on the board of Vermont Humanities. She lives with her wife in Burlington, Vermont. Welcome, Judith. <laughs> everybody here for Pride, and um, I just want to thank Linda and Robin for organizing this, and Bon Mom and Orca for recording it, and all of you for wanting to be here, so it's really fun. And I am a white woman with gray hair, um, and I'm wearing a pais green paisley turtleneck and a black sweater my um, description of self before we begin. So I'm going to read eight poems. And for pride, I decided I was going to make all of them read all love poems or poems that are love poems in one way or another. <laughs> so um, in that celebration, I'm starting with The Climb. We're that couple standing at the edge Debt, second breakfast, a generous shimmer over appalling depth. Shorebirds, sinking heels, sequences beginning to fail. Today, drowsiness dogged me. We rose early, then try to remember. Slowly, a picture, a zigzag stairway up from the beach, and that's it. Here, the banked clouds hover over the spray. The grass so young and pokes up peacock blue against the greening past. This is the sepia and the magic ink of aging. The moment beyond recall, my mind, sorry, speaking of which I just lost my place, my mind increasingly blank. Well, I reason, why fuss? Face out to the shore with you, reading in a chair. The cloth rim of your hat, a tender curve around everything. Yes, I remember. The climb up sweet hillsides, your body over mine and under. Salt cove behind your knee, a great guffaw of love. And just today as we passed, the breeze picked up a few shoots on the dune, turquoise in the sun and silver. So uh, <clears throat> the poems also, as you can tell, also address aging a lot. And they're situ situated in the natural world, by which I mean the queer world. And by which I mean an abundant, very surprising, beautiful, experimental, wayward world. So um, that immortality is great. <laughs> <laughs> An essay on age. It was a day to sing the praises of fire, to bow to its purpose, toes 
stretched apart, layers peeled, our bodies gathered into their warmest folds. It was a day of mists, of freezing and love. Now the night when it returns will be kinder. Now the moon will dominate the dogs, sending them wild into the burdock, and we will have them for hours on their backs. This is the bright snap of apple, catch in the throat. You realize how deeply you have loved. You blow hard on the flames, and each day is remembered mainly for the brush of lips, for the way we stand hip to hip in sheets of rain, somehow covered enough. And the next one is ground. It starts out simply at a campsite, a companionable ring of rocks, navigably even ground, a bit rocky for bare feet, yellowing birches, maple tops turning, bathing suit dripping on the line. So much bravery depends on love. This morning you rose early for work, sun dazzling the mist, a warm cup lifted between us. Now the day here is full of slowness, hours after breakfast on foot among ferns, a long time listening, dry leaves dropping into the dishes, a shuffling on the forest floor, the broken bars of the ripples building and rebuilding, sips of coffee, bottom grits in my teeth, a fold-up chair near our fold-up shelter, the dog asleep again in the leaves, checkered tablecloth, red potholder. Once again, I'm afraid. Would I know such gratitude without you? Get away. Mm -hmm. Descending the dune, fine sand and deepest snow, there's a comfort in being no one known. There is so much sky, and there is walking the edge, one foot above, one foot below, two women weathered to a crinkling love. There's the luck of aging, a whole seashore empty but for us, the plummet and wings bursting back out. Last night I watched your face above the comforter, knitted cap half on, half off, your cheek flushed in firelight, your eyes tender toward the page of a book. There was a time, summer dusk, when the children screamed, scaring themselves again and again until they were hushed and the rituals of tooth and towel began. There were the two of us, summer and winter, padding down the pads. In this sweep of sand, we sink with each step and our lives, comfortingly small, go on bundled in our shells like beetles scaling the rim of a bowl. What stays beneath the surface, the ocean waves won't tell. Not much crawls out to meet us, perhaps a nervous shoreline skitter, something upsetting those seaweed piled with stones. There, not far into the waves, is something we think we know. First a nose, then whiskers and curious eyes. At night, the tips of our noses ride the pillows, and our eyes deep under search, search again, and wait to follow. The Plate. Along the road, the winter birds are stuck to the trees. It's cold. Chocolate doesn't last an hour on the plate. Something's wrong in the middle. Swallowing is hard. The birds hang round as apples, no more than an arm's distance up. Our failing steps disturb nothing but us, not the still brown birds, nor the rows of urban compost heaped beneath coverlets of stiff white gulls, nor the hawks who are somewhere in this strip of furrows and trees. We can't go far for fear of a sudden stitch, a catch of breath. This level of illness is new. We turn to go home. I realize again I'm in love. It happened in a sea of summer freckles. It happened as camembert softens in its skin, impossible to refuse. 
fingers full, I'm stuffed with love. Before I knew it, the square and the oval, angled jaw, wondering brow, incalculable thin rays, all residue of smiles, were drilled into my mind, described more distinctly, more convincingly than any text I've ever learned. There are tests for what hurts her, quartz and plastic tourniquets. The birds pillow their hearts in stillness. I try not to worry. I find a few foods. Neither a bad joke nor a limerick helps. But alone while she sleeps, the sound loosed from my throat sings, helpless and bare as any beast alive on legs to dance across ice in the glittering night. I am granted a great love. You must consider that once we stood a moment at the top, snow heaped at our hips, the stillness on our cheeks, not pain exactly, that we waited and waited, life messy and moist, that we saw with new eyes this world bright and shocking, that your roundness now is lifted here within my palm, curved palm, fingers arching back, that we knew nothing of our bodies. We knew only the snow was deep, and no one said we couldn't go there. So the next one that I'm going to read is actually um, part of a longer series of poems that were performed at a an anniversary celebration at the, at the Flynn in their black box space, the Flynn space, for the 40th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was accompanied by choreography, but you'll just have to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so these were a series of moments, so I'm going to sort of pause for a couple of beats between each one, a series of very short poems. Covers thrown. The gentlest bite. Pear juice runs wild on my tongue. Morning bed still warm. Tracing deep circles, seconds go by. Fingers still amid the blossoms. Gravely glancing down, the first bud lifts one petal. Those close can't hold back. Rising from dense leaves, you may see these buds or not. They will feel your touch. Later, steeped in work, morning returns. A breeze stirs. Covers thrown, you stretch. Slowly, the tension leaves my hips to remember dawn, morning gates flung. Early summer, dear, light melting with the grass. You completely kissed. The new shoots can't wait. They lean out of the basket, famished. More coming. Hip pulled out of joint. The aging lover rolls flat. Old gate, part busted. <laughs> Still dripping, you step from the tile to oil, palm, touch, rosy, utterly. These are yours to hold, these mine for the moment, unwrapped, both feasting. Summer dusk deepens. You draw me to the window. Moon slipped from its gown. And one more poem, which is in conversation with another poem by the poet C.K. Williams. He was somebody who wrote with a lot of long lines that allowed him to do a lot of um, moral introspection. And um, there was a critic who, an early critic, I don't mean a, a detractor critic, um, a commentator who described his work as something like, if I can remember it, um, psychic paralysis in spite of the need to connect somehow. <laughs> I so the title of my poem, Is This Prayer, is a line from his poem called The Vessel. 
And I'm going to start with a quote from his poem, which is, what makes me think, though, that the region of my soul in which all this activity is occurring is a site which God might consider an engaging or even acceptable spiritual location? So that was C.K. Williams. But is the soul so divided? And did it take shape with the usual plan? One region labeled prayer, and the others marked boiler room or half bath? Or could prayer change places the way my dog does over here in South Burlington, on the second most traveled path in Red Rocks Park, just before the overlook with the skinny railing? Or thank God, my dog didn't fall all the way down that time I didn't see him behind me, and when I went back, there he was on a ledge beneath the overhang, out of reach with no way to get him back up. And what if the soul's only prayer region gets a false negative result for spiritual activity on God's test probe just because of the time? For instance, now, on this gloomy, unsoulful day. There was a patch just now of blue sky, and it lifted my spirits. Putting aside for now, CK's thought about God's thought, what throws me off, and now that patch of blue sky, by the way, is gone, is if I still want a way to say I am, or was, grateful, then do I say the blue patch was given to all of us or just to me? How presumptuous is it to claim to be an us? If I lived on a dry plain, my farm soil cracked, would a blue sky elevate my soul? What about the many, some even here in the gloom, who wouldn't want any part of my prayer, thank you very much. I'm a little baffled by who when I pray I am, but, Putting that consideration aside as well, if I just start and let God figure it out, is it the blue or the light that's giving me a lift? It's the blue. But if I'm grateful for a clear sky, what about the rest? Shouldn't I be grateful for the gloom? I'm not that good at thinking alone. And thank God I've still got my dog. I tried to climb down at the side where there wasn't a guardrail, but it was too steep. I couldn't get close, and that's when he started to cry. And the neighbor who climbed down and back up with me said I'd have to call the fire department. So I got out my phone and started to dial when suddenly the dog was at my side. And the neighbor gently suggested that maybe next time I should follow the law and keep my dog on a leash. <laughs> so it kind of feels empty to say I'm grateful for anything. Sun, rain, or safekeeping that, just, that sustains just me. But not to ignore him for too long. I wonder if CK would say God enters his soul to get to the region of prayer. Or does God, sorry, lost my place. Or does God in CK's mind just put a straw into the soul and suck out the prayer? <laughs> All of which brings me to the physical body and how we're stuck here inside our separate skins. No wonder CK longs for God, who's a big one for getting under the skin. And it's lonely for us, but at least we can understand each other through some magic of receptors and nerves. And I'm not talking about sex, by the way, so that's comforting. <laughs> and now we know how trees converse. So maybe we're not as separate as it seems, and someday someone will find little filaments that connect us. Though that would be too bad, because it's way more poetic and better exercise if our souls could jump through our skins like God. And that's how we agree on budgets and sewage systems. <laughs> it's lucky, given we're each an I, we can even perceive each other. And that's just the start. There's more to it, but once you go down that path, you get to everyone you miss. And even if you forget about love and death, there's so much on the side, like trees and sky. And the way if you like them, if you even start in on being thankful for this life, it breaks your poor heart. I worked this out once, how to form a prayer with my wife, how to form a prayer with my wife, who would really rather be called my partner, but that would take too long to explain. And now I can't remember what I decided. That's the trouble with personal prayer. My wife, if I may, with her permission, use again a problematic shorthand for a relationship that is deeply nuanced, who is more spiritual than I, also more efficient with words, <laughs> says she likes to get her prayers from the book. They're catchy, almost like a tune for Kaufman's Rybrick, of the highest quality. <laughs> for her, being agreeably spiritual, some of the words pop out and she takes them aside for a private run. No surprise, the dog likes her better than he likes me. Every day she plunks down on the couch and says to him, come here, come here and talk to me. She's so cozy and lovable. I should go home and nuzzle her. <laughs> and as for God, see, problematic above. <laughs>
describe ourselves when we come up to the mic. So I am a cis female with giant uncontrollable hair and a short sleeve black shirt and polka dots. And um, Linda had come to me, I wanted to just sort of say how we came about to have this reading. Linda came to me a few months ago and said, let's do some queer readings for Pride Month and I got really excited about it. So so we did, we're doing those. Um, we have another one at Fox Market on the 16th. There's some little flyers back there if you want to grab one. And also, um, I'm doing quite a few poetry events in the area. Um, and you can get my contact information on here. I do a monthly series at the Front Co-op Gallery on Berry Street. So I'm, one Thursday a month, I have two readers. Um, and we're booked through 2023, which is very exciting. Um, and then just other pop-up events around the area. Um, there's something else I wanted to tell you, but I don't remember what it is now. But there's a bathroom right here, in case you're wondering. And then if you don't want to use the one that's immediately in this room, there's two out in the main area, too, that just need a key. Um, and food. Oh, there's food? Yes. <laughs> there's food that Linda brought, because she's amazing. There's some really festive rainbow cups that you can have water in. And Rick, Rick Agron's here from Goddard Radio. Um, bon Mott is the name of his show. It's not Goddard Radio anymore, is it? Central Vermont Community Radio. Central Vermont Community Radio. And he has a show on Sundays at 5, where he plays recordings of, he does the, um, the front readings that, that I've been hosting and readings such as this. He'll play the audio. Um, so you can catch those. And then they're in the archives for two weeks after they're aired. Orca's also here taping, so it's exciting. And um, happy pride. <laughs> uh, we are down one reader than we expected, so I just wanted to sneak in a poem or two from my favorite queer poet, C.A. Conrad. Yeah. Obsessed. So if you don't know this person, definitely read. Um, just a couple short ones in here I want to share with you. Um, and then we'll have Ken, and I'll tell you all about it. I can it her. <laughs> okay, here it is. <laughs> this is called Jupiter 3. It's from this book, While Standing in Line for Death. And um, they do a series of somatic rituals and then write poetry. Um, after them, and they explain all the rituals in this book, and then write the, through the poems after. So, this one's called Jupiter Three. Can I babysit? Teach them basic disobedience to be deaf to factory bells. There's an annoying poet who says she killed poetry. Just ask her at each poetry reading. Is this another memorial service for you? If poetry is dead, call me a necrophiliac. I don't want children to inherit the earth. I want them to snatch it from heedless adults before it's milked all wish lists at once is heavenly. And with that, we'll introduce Kim Ward. Um, Kim Ward is a native Vermonter who has lived in Montpelier for 25 years. She has her master's in performance poetry from Goddard College, founded the Vermont Playwrights Circle, and works for many local theaters. She's had productions of her poetic plays produced by herself and Moxie Productions. She's been published in Green Mountain Review, Metropolis, and Vermont Times, written the book Lyrics and Music for a 10-minute musical called Man vs. Squirrel, which you can find on YouTube, <laughs> and has worked as a choreographer, dancer, actor, director, and theater producer for over 30 years. Welcome, Kim. Come on up. Quarters, white woman with spiky salt and pepper hair and a lot of orange on today. <laughs> you need to know. And I'm wearing my dyke boots because <laughs> I love dyke boots. Um, so I, uh, Linda, was as I walked in, was saying to me, "Oh, I was just trying to text you," and I'm like, "Why?" And it was 
was like two minutes of six, so that tells you the rest of what you need to know about me. Because I was here, but I was like wandering. And if anyone is hearing clicks of the door and people coming in and out, it's because there's another big event going on here tonight, which is a meeting about homelessness. And I wish I was uh, able to split myself in two so I could go to both of these things. I have no idea what I'm going to read tonight. And it's really a weird thing to have just recently done the reading at the front and feel like, well, I just read all that. <laughs> so I've been typing up some stuff that's newer. and. I thought maybe I would read some of that, and thus the iPad. This is called Against the Abyssal Plain. 4 a.m., no sleep, just a crackling brain pan of anxiety. Three of us are left. The one whose handprint dusted my ribs long, is long gone. The two of you left with me, draining down a bar sink, while I hold myself alone, one sister against the abyssal plain. Um, I'm 57 and I've just this year started writing poems about being related to people who are um, addicts um, because, 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 so it's been very interesting. This is called Wrong Directions. Take the scenic route, they said. It's nice, it's slower, and more scenic until like a sand mandala in the middle of a city street, it gets stomped on, shuffled over, blown by an acrid smoke of the garbage truck, of life until all semblance of direction are scraped away and you are left, if lucky, on a dead end dwindling goat path in the woods on some farmer's land, a rusted rifle dancing between your eyes. <laughs> sure you want to take that seat? <laughs> I, have, I have never read any of these. I thought it was kind of fun. This is called Although. And this came out of a prompt, speaking of exercises, <clears throat> where um, you, well, you'll probably hear, but it's, it's definitely free, freestyle, but it's got some re repetitive words in it. Although I took myself to be an adult, I turned out to be a baby in an aging carriage of carrion bones. Although I thought I had cut you free, my foot got entangled in your seeping soul as it slithered out of the last bottle you left in my apartment. Although I thought I was a woman, turned out I was a flea on the back of a cow. Although I let my rancor go, it flew back to me in a murmuration of ancient starlings, their yellow beaks, a splintered headlight spearing me, ramming into my chest, exploding my heart into a cloud of red ravens that pecked out my eyes. If only they had punctured my eardrums. All in times. <laughs> that poem. This is an older poem. Last time I read, I, I was telling folks that I do a lot of um, work with the German Futhark runes, which were, you know, at one point a very ancient magical system that people used sometimes nefariously and sometimes for good. And then um, I've been just trying to sort of recapture some of the more positive elements of the runes because they've been used by a lot of terrible white supremacist people. And I sort of didn't realize how badly that was until I got like, you know, years into just loving the history. So this is called Dried Ghost. A small cave, smoke on the water. An empty longbow once filled with settlers. The rune secrets itself inside her chest. The men gather, trumpeting for war. Hunting doves sniff the carving knife. A dried ghost curls under her tongue, its leaf of death dislodging teeth waiting to spring into fruition on the end of the spear and the rune she carves bloody-handed. <clears throat> What's next? Mm -hmm. hmm, this is called fill in the blank. I'm such a fill in the blank yourself. You're such a I fill in the blank myself. It's different every time. I trust you, and then sure enough, you crack the egg into the fire and not the pan. And anyone, for Pete's sake, you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul, you're robbing me and taking it all. A little bitter. <laughs> I'll read you one that's maybe just confusing. So the, this poem, um, there's a quote at the beginning of this. There's a book called Females by Andrea Long Chu. 
And in it, she says, and the combination of Eve plus testosterone would produce Adam. Mm -hmm. Formula, fire, vessel, strap. In what way did I fully first come to pass? Eclipse, skip, turn. My skin truly burns to be let loose on the cobblestones of the city. And if I had been thicker, taller, less pretty, had the formula have raged over a Bunsen a bit longer, then would I have surely been the king of my own destiny, the queen left behind in the mud pit, in the tin plus estrogen minus father equals trailer of my childhood home to rot. Oh, okay, so I will raise on that remotely related really, really to pride. This is called I Can Be. Pink ribbons, classical tutus, point shoes, a bird folded on hers. I can be pirate boots, leather pants, poet shirt with billowed sleeves, and swashbuckling sword. I can be jeans and frumpy t-shirt. I can be duck boots and chain key ring. I can be barefoot in spring dress with daffodils in its folds. I can be. I asked my ex-partner what I should read for tonight. <laughs> And she um, lived with me for 17 and a half years, bless her, and went all the way through my master's degree with me. So she said, read that one about the truth that you wrote. Um, and I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, it's called Telling the Truth. There was going to be a fire. I saw it. The bookcase was aflame, burning through the dark, words spitting outward like stars. When I got home, it was over. The kitchen window gaped blackly. It made me shiver to think how close I'd been to death. The night came back to me while picking through bedroom ashes. We tried to rub loneliness from our bodies. Your drunkenness was full of new shyness. My fear of entanglement, a raw river that parted the flames between us until I became a lone flame whispering, became a word I could not hear, a dark warmth, a space at the center of your eye, in the center of a woman, in the word. And the word fit itself inside the cry of an owl that beat its wings against me until you spoke your tongue sending forth rivers of truth that finally did not burn the darkness, but scattered it like stars. I wrote that, I wrote that poem after briefly having a fling with a friend from college who was coming out as trans as I was coming out as bi as we were all coming out as something. <laughs> so, I guess it kind of fits. I know many, not as many people in Vermont lost people from COVID, uh, as in some places that I did lose a, I can't even read this poem now that I'm talking about it. I lost a friend who was 44 to COVID, uh, and he caught it and posted online um, when he got it. Oh, leave it to me to get COVID for the second time just before my second booster, and then he died. So, um, so let's read that. More uplifting poems. Um, it's called The Stages of Grief. There are not five stages of grief, no matter what scholars tell you. There are an infinite number of infinitesimal stages this grief digs into, going down and down into the depths of my bones, my viscera, my cells, continuing into that hidden layer only physicists shake hands with, until it has burrowed deeper than even they can touch. Perhaps if you took this grief and placed it in the CERN collider and spun it long enough, centrifuging my love and loss and anger and grief, until the important parts rose to the top and the rest sunk from sight, you would find the many stages it holds. But then again, no. Only if you spun this anguish until it splayed out away from Earth, from your solar system, into the galaxy, so that it ran for the edges of the universe, only then would you see all its stages. And then and there, we could wait for it all to collapse into the fisted ball of what people call God's hand, so that with the next big bang, the blistering heat of creation, it could be handed out again, the body of the universe, the blood of the universe, to be born beneath the tongue of a new world. Only then would this grief be finished. All right, now I'm gonna tell you my shortest poem so I can not feel like crap. Vegetable strength is saying no to broccoli. <laughs> it's my shortest poem I've ever written. <laughs> it's true. I'm just saying. Vegetable strength. Play, playing roughshod. 
mumble from above. No God, I assure you. The drunks play roughshod, dragging furniture, each other, rowing machine themselves through bottle after joint until at dawn, they tumble down to the back parking lot to piss themselves for the day. <laughs> it's biographical. This is called Swaddled. I swaddled my way through life for so long, wrapping up in sacrifice, sacrificing autonomy. Now I autonomize the night, monetize, monotonize, realizing the strength in oneness, enjoying the freedom of invisibility, even as alone tides into and out of lonely, fist up with the sun, then tiding back with the stars. Black night swaddles my body, memorializes itself. Snap knee to sharp vertebra, sinks into the loam of my widow pen. Wow, that's too dark. Next <laughs> up. Anybody here like Octavio Paz? I love his work. Um, and there was a line in a poem many years ago that I read where he said something was happening between blue and good evening. So that's the name of this poem, Between Blue and Good Evening. She said between blue and good evening, there was always a rainbow, and the ponies were always fast, and the toys were always new. She said in there I had time to decide what I would be, where I might go, how I'd fit in. So I tried to step back in time to that very place of innocence, between blue and the pillar of the moon, between the match flare and the shadowed cry. Then I slipped through before evening, after blue, slipped until I had fallen behind the sower's moon and the reapers. <coughs> well, this is from another word. Uh, 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 what do you call that? Uh, ex uh, I know it's called. It was in a class, but you can feel an exercise. I have no words. It's from the prompt um, where we were told to take uh, you take a nap. Two different nouns that don't go together, and you put them together, and you write a poem. And it's called the salt of infancy. The salt of infancy began with the first inmate's death, curled as he was around the tongue of space that was the cuff window made for hands that somehow held his head. Stupid inmate, the public says, good riddance. But was he that stupid or that desperate in trying to escape the ghouls of that terrible place? There he lay, nestled as a limp fetus in a womb of iron, even as he left his body and ascended, the granulated mist of his soul flinging itself up over barbed wire fence, flung salt in a gale storm, cutting across the plains, headed for home, until he came to rest on the near empty dinner table and was shaken into each relative's meal before the family even knew the prisoner had returned, salt to salt, earth to earth, to their empty hands. And I wrote that after reading a news article about somebody literally doing that and killing himself. He was trying to get out of this prison. And oh, very sad. I need to do something. Say, is there anything in this list I have read? Okay. This poem comes from a very long piece called Angel in the Fire that I wrote. It's called Mother, I Dared Not Ask You. Why I could not seem to love only men. To swish my square hips just so. To leave behind my favorite boots for a pair of your immaculate pumps. You would not listen if I told you I don't believe the skirt makes the woman. I'm not attracted to that great hairy lump of a muscle across the room that winks and calls me sweetie when he orders a drink. I'm intrigued instead by the small-boned man, by the piano with the delicate fingers who plays the cello and smiles so blindly. I'm all a flutter when the waitress at the table, uh, table five with a shaved head and combat boots winks her pierced eye at me and says she's dying to taste my dull, unpainted lips after hours. I know you don't believe my search for the perfect balance, that you don't want to release me from the grip of your ideals. I find myself covered with each bit of praise you ever gave. Each nod or no has stuck to me like starfish splayed over my cheekbones until your portrait was complete and only my frightened eyes peered through, reflecting your identical face until now. 
Now I go out to pick the parts of my gender from the air. Like great bubbles, they float just out of reach as they climb out of me in a twisting dance. Each piece might burst as the soap dries, or solidify as the glass cools into Victorian witch balls, so that if I place them in the window, I know they can deflect the worst of the storm while still attracting the lightning I long to feel on my skin. Thank you. That was a very big quote. Chasing each other. Just flying through. Thank you, Kim. I thought that Kim read last month. Sam is reading an office. Yes, at the front. So, such a tight-knit little poetry community we have here. Um, so, Sam Stockwell's up next. Sam has published in Agni, North, America, North American Review, and The New Yorker, among others. In July 2023, her new book, Musical Figures, will be published by 30 West Publishing. Her two previous books, Theater of Animals and Reciting, Recital, won the National Poetry Series USA and the Editor's Prize at Elixir, respectively. She won the Massachusetts Poetry Festival First Poem Prize, was selected as the Editor's Choice at Panopoli, I don't know, okay, <laughs> I tried, and was the Editor's Choice for Brain Mill Press. Recent poems are in On the Seawall and Sugar House Review and are forthcoming in Plowshares, 124 and others. So welcome, Sam. Thanks for this opportunity. I'm um, actually I really short. <laughs> I'm almost five feet. I'm wearing dark clothing and I'm old and wrinkled. I'm going to read a few poems from my forthcoming book, and then I'll read some other stuff, and we'll see how it goes. Space Program. Marilyn Monroe dies the year we shuffle into the gym to watch John Glenn in his slow orbit across the monumental sky. Mrs. Tufani, the fourth grade teacher, exhorts us to remember this day. And I remember Martin threw a rock ushering a geyser of blood from Danny's head, and Mrs. Tufani pressing paper towels on him as though she was forcing him into the ground. At night, I thought of Mrs. Tufani helping me into my spacesuit as I lie sweating in my bed. First Confession. Stephen ground my face in the snowbank and ran to his mother's house. Martin smelled like cow shit and held my hand in third grade. My best friend held a vel velvet postcard of the Virgin Mary glowing in the dark. I loved her and wanted to marry her, though she committed mortal sins. We wanted God to keep us forever, riding our bikes over the iron bridge, waving to our distant parents. My parents were not just eccentric, they were really crazy. And but we had a pretty large uh, bunch of relatives, cousins, who would come by to visit, which was an interesting experience. Second cousin. One of my cousins came to introduce her betrothed. They were decked in gawkish hopefulness, he to be an engineer and she to secretarial school. His wrists stretched out of his sleeves as he wrung his hands in his lap and finally hung them off his knees. She dripped her beringed hand on one thigh and another before tossing it to the back of the couch. The couch was orange plaid, and a rooster-shaped lamp stood on the table. Our living room was painted green with splotches of blue from my father's mix of latex and oils. My cousins were going to live in Florida. They were going to live in sunshine. The future had lit lamps at their feet. Dream. We wandered through my grandfather's house sorting plates and twigs and throwing pebbles out the window, 
In the yard, squiffs tangled in our hair, and we couldn't find our way. We met two women coming back from a wedding, one in a beaded vest. They gave us a glass of wine, and for years we quarreled about recipes. We followed the wide path out of town and found our own house blackened. In a clearing between two birches were our broken pots and mildewed clothes, and I wept for the things grown old without me. This is a more recent poem called Another Travelogue, which is about not going anywhere. <laughs> JR is my wife. JR and I were at the bar, and I noticed a brunette mopping the space with her quiet. It was the natural place to be contemplative. I won't contemplate a lot of things because I might cry in the open. Old or young, tears go snickering down at the joining of a tiny kindness and the smell of aftershave. Outside the bar, I could hear the weed whacker gulping drafts of gasoline and roaring at the fence line. I couldn't eavesdrop, and I lost her whisperings. I dreamt I was shepherding rows of families along high ledges on the outside of buildings, displaced. The streets below were flooded and we kept inching along. JR brought, bought focaccia for Elizabeth. The attendant at the bakery chides her. JR can't hear and nods in place of that. It's tiring to work so hard for the ordinary. Bread is buried in its perfections. The ends of it grow slowly from the ends. The ribs of it grow slowly from the ends of flour and water. Some houses, like Elizabeth's, grow from the efforts of their owners and children. A carbuncle of rooms, a garden with parsnips and tomatoes. But if you build something cantilever, cantilevered, every room is a bridge to the space beyond it. Is every bridge a ledge? At tops, the mangoes were hard, but the fish looked dead soft. The clerk at the greengrocers didn't make eye contact. Were we not buying the most exciting potatoes? We went to the co-op, swoops of lines back to the natural cosmetics, and people in the stunned contemplation of olives and pepperoncini. I want to lie down in the aisle drinking Prosecco and avoiding other choices. I sometimes think of ourselves as poor because we do not own a home, instead dogs, and we do not go far. This poem is very abstract and and um, somewhat magical. So it's about two sparrows, and the spar sparrows are named Distance and Temerity. The sparrows were enamored, but sounded like a congregation of worried mothers. Distance and Temerity flew from Central Park to the bakery. Like dark flakes, they fluttered to the ground and ate crumbs of coffee cake and cinnamon buns. Everyone emerged, emerged from the bakery with white paper cups held out like lamps and hot cups of coffee jiggling in the other hand. Joggers zoomed by in black tights and headbands, a fleet, said Distance. Sweetest plums, agreed Temerity, to the smell of sweat. After the joggers, the businessmen and women, dragging brown briefcases or swinging them like dull missiles. Then children going to school, the girls in pink and purple, the boys in blue and red, with secrets like feathers. Is there a sparrow waking at 2 a.m. knowing he's alone? No. I often can't sleep. That's been especially true for the last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and at this, and at this point, my wife wakes me up, even though I'm actually asleep, which is pretty rare. Sprite. My wife untangled me from a spurt of sleep, and in the cold, dark snow crust, we skippered over to our neighbor. His top half collapsed over his lower, braced in the snow by one fist, the wheelchair hunched over his back, his head inching to the snow at the end of his ramp. His voice softer than dark, but J.R. had heard him as she limped along the road with the urgent need of the dog at the coldest hour. And now the two old of us maneuvered him back in his chair and back into his house. 
We crunched on empty soda cans by the ramp, and we also had empty cans and pets to be rich with. And where was his lonely mother, who talks with her chihuahua as if he were reason and temperance? <laughs> In this poem, I get very sick, but obviously I live. And, <laughs> and this sort of, this is another poem that jumps around from here to there. Spaghetti. I was scanned. They gave me morphine. I was grayish. On the way to the hospital, we passed a Jack and Jill adult superstore next to Bob's Carpet Mart. You can see how that would work. For days, the rain had rippled roads until they disappeared. In the hospital, I heard a clump of voices move down the hall, talking of rain, robots, disappearances. Last summer, we were eating plates of pasta in a pretentious restaurant when the son of the doctor in the next table choked and hurled himself out of his chair. The doctor wrapped her arms around his chest and heaved up. She was small but strong, and he vomited the meat chunk and drink copiously. His eyes reddened, he was shaking, and he was not two feet from us, so we knew how much his stepfather disapproved of his spikes of hair. You can see why I'm telling you this. The waiter stood by with a towel. The mother showed satisfaction in her skill and accuracy. The dinner was over and we two left. The restaurant closed later that year, but probably for unrelated reasons. <laughs> when I was 12, we ate Chef Boyardee spaghetti dinners. The box of pasta rattled like pickup sticks. The grains of meat in the tin of sauce like sand and powdery cheese, <coughs> ambrosia. This is the sound of my father's car on the gravel of the driveway. This is the green dress my mother wore, and this the green suit my grandfather wore as custodian of a distant college after he lost the farm. My father fished not because we were poor, though we were, but because it was a prize, the lake's candy. My father and my uncle wanted me to come with them to an observation tower overlooking the beach. I suspected it was a trick because they were, after all, dead, and my uncle laughed a little bitter. I wasn't very trusting. We were passing around a flask of whiskey. I didn't want to come be dead, although I'd like to live by an ocean. Would I remain turbulent? In another dream, my dead grandfather was driving me on the back roads of Maine to someplace I wanted. Could anything else be so far away? When my grandmother died and we were standing in the kitchen, he cried because she had been in such pain, and he couldn't rescue her. Sometimes the miracles people court are shy about showing up. I was scanned. They gave me morphine. I thought I would like it better. I think I'm going to be all right for a while, and I've been thinking of you the entire time. That's where it ends, the book of days, and there aren't other kinds. I'm patting the chair beside me for a friend dissolving in smoke. I keep a handful of ash by my bedside because of those that are sacred and need carrying. I was reading the Beatitudes and the pets raced a handful of air under their legs. And you know the joy you get that's not a distance from others, but a gathering? And you get it in your feet from dirt and grass and the stray wrapper of an ice cream it's a tumult of misery, misery lightened by possibility. And even if sleepless, you forgive the crankiness and coldness of a stranger and nestle in your heart, the one you were sure had exploded in a distant universe. This is a poem that has never quite worked. So I thought I would try it tonight, but it still doesn't. <laughs> An absence, mostly, of aunts. I ate sugar daddies and sugar babies. Atomic fireballs, chocolate, chocolate stars, and squirrel nut zippers. Peach blossoms and butterfingers glued in my pocket. My baby teeth abscessed. I ate food, too, spaghetti, potatoes, and I was sick mumps, measles, bronchitis. My head bobbled in concussions from car accidents, from car accidents, my father a little drunk. I had pneumonia, a kidney infection. I was allergic to mold, and dust made my lungs clap flat. 
In another age, I would have been dead by five and cute, my hair haloed. I wheezed through math, but I knew no order as my father moved us from town to town. And even though I've worked to write this down, I find it unsurprising, a latecomer to the age of reason. It, it takes place in a conference. When I was working in human services, I went to a lot of dreadful conferences, and probably whatever field you were in, you had the same experience. Mm -hmm. So this is called At the Conference, and it pops from place to place in the conference. And it starts with one of those incredibly boring, long activities that you do with chalkboards and whiteboards. Self-obsolete, says Donna, and her hand swerves with a sharpie, sandwich in the other. It's been a long meeting. We are finagling the jargon with our knives and forks, yellow-fingered from cigarettes, choking, wishing we could wind up somewhere less hopeless. Under the sadness oceans, we watch a sunbather in a pork pie hat chide his partner, then pull his shorts from the crack in his ass. We envy everyone who is not suffocating in air-conditioned lunches. The sales clerk is growing a mustache as slowly as his eyelashes. The store smells like bread and fennel, and a customer revolves around the shelves, lifting glass jars to read the labels. Someone slams down a tiny cup of espresso and shoves away a newspaper. Because we are the combined weight of sorriness and <coughs> unabashed chis chiseling, because the young have not yet broken their glacial skin, because we have put our foot down and leapt up again, as though every lie we ever told was crawling up our legs. to read some poems and I'm going to say, I couldn't possibly read that one. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> deep in an oak tree. We bought a flashlight, bread, and you're wearing a vest. Half my life, but more. I carry a notebook filled with drawings and words. Not the same words, but words for this section of the trail. We take our clothes off by a pond and sleep under the wild night. It doesn't seem terrifying. The words I wrote about dreams and the words I wrote about monsters, how much I misunderstood them. Thank you.